What's up my little flowers? Welcome back to Hell, and welcome to the highly anticipated video essay on LGBTQ+, and homophobia in the K-pop industry. Many of you have been asking for this specific video ever since I mentioned potentially making one in my dating in the K-pop industry video. It's been a few months waiting, but I finally present you with this essay. I would like to say that I originally would have liked to have had this video out in June for Pride Month, but because of personal reasons, I fell behind on my upload schedule. Towards the end of June, I could have rushed this video to get it out in time, but I didn't want to. It's more important to me that I create a video that treats the topic with as much respect and time as possible. I didn't want to rush research for this just to say I got an LGBTQ plus video out in June. That comes across as performative activism to me rather than genuine care for the community. I would rather take the extra time and really get this important topic right. And who says Pride Month is over in June? Pride Month is every month on my channel. Welcome to the year-long event. All year, every year. Before I jump into the disclaimers and then into the actual video, I want to take this time to thank all of my viewers, whether they are subscribed or this is their first time here. Here. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and if you are a member of the LGBTQ plus community, I welcome you to my channel wholeheartedly, and you always have my love and support. Much love to you all, and let's get into our disclaimers. I have four quick disclaimers of importance to cover here. Number one, know that this is a tough topic to listen to at times when discussing the hatred and hardships that LGBTQ people have had to face in the past, and currently even today. If you think that some of the descriptions of this hatred might hurt you, then please, I encourage you to take care of yourself first and not watch this video or come back at a later time. Always take care of yourself first. This is my verbal trigger warning for some of the things that we will be discussing. Number two, know that this is a huge subject, and I mean huge. I can't even begin to cover every single thing about the LGBTQ plus community and specifically its relationship with K-pop, but I covered some of the most important parts. Feel free to add some of your own opinions and research below in the comments as you guys know that I do love reading those. It's my favorite part of making videos as long as it's done respectfully to all the parties involved. Number three, I'll be talking about about some real life examples later in the video of artists who have expressed an anti-gay sentiment. I tried my best to see if they still feel that way now and if they ever apologized, but I might have easily missed something or someone. I don't mean to hate anyone or to drag up old drama that might have been addressed, I just merely talked about examples that had importance that I wanted to discuss. And finally, number four, please, as always, be nice and respectful in the comments to me and everyone else. I absolutely will not tolerate any hatred in the comments directed towards the LGBTQ plus community. I will just block you and delete the comment. You can have opinions, even those that differ from mine, but if hatred is your opinion, then that's not an opinion. You're just rude, and you should reflect on that. This channel is a safe place for all members of the community, and we are going to keep it that way. Thank you in advance. Number five, also, don't sue me. Companies, I'm poor. Please, I can't even afford your albums, much less a lawsuit. And I guess with that, we've covered all the disclaimers that I need to, so let's get into the video, and as always, I hope you enjoy it. Now, as always, I cannot cover the entire history of LGBTQ plus rights. I can't even begin to scratch the surface of that. So instead, we're gonna focus on two big moments that will help define our later conversations, Stonewall and some of the Supreme Court of America's rulings. I'll be focusing on America's history before diving into South Korea's because I wanna compare old Hollywood to the modern day K-pop industry as they have so many similarities that I wanna make a separate video. In 1969, in every state in America, with the exception of Illinois, homosexuality was as illegal. As History.com points out, even so much as having a gay employee or serving a gay customer would have a bar or restaurant shut down. Most gay bars that were allowed to operate did so illegally under the protection of the mafia, who paid officials and the law to look the other way. But don't get confused, the mafia didn't do this out of support for gay people, but merely because they saw money to be made off of them. An untapped revenue source, if you will. Something that we can use to draw a parallel to the K-pop industry with later. The mafia would even threaten to out wealthy gay patrons if they stepped out of line. On June 24th, 1969, police raided the Stonewall Bar and arrested many employees and took alcohol. They did this stating their reason was that the bar operated without a proper liquor license. On the night and early morning of June 27th through June 28th of 1969, police raided the bar yet again, hoping to fully shut it down. Undercover police officers entered the bar specifically targeting drag queens or cross-dressers, as it was a crime of the time to dress as the opposite gender. More police arrived and the riots soon began as police began to beat up a woman who was dressing as a man for complaining that the handcuffs were too tight. Many people of color were said to have made a significant impact on the riots as well, being some of the first to spring into action. I encourage you to look into and watch documentaries about Stonewall because I can't possibly cover it all here, but in the next few days, members of the LGBTQ community continued to gather at Stonewall and protest where they faced serious backlash from the police. But as we all know, Stonewall would go on to become a turning point in history and become the reason that Pride Month is in June. Now, to talk about some of the Supreme Court rulings would also take forever, 
but they had a seriously bad history. They denied gay magazines or media to be published, labeling it as obscene and not protected under the First Amendment. They denied gay marriage time and time again, saying that they had no right to get married. They even upheld sodomy laws that said that two consenting adults in the privacy of their own home could not consent to, and excuse my language here, I know we normally don't get x-rated, children, cover your ears, but they could not consent to oral or anal sex and could face charges if discovered. While the courts did have a few decent rulings in the late 90s to early 2000s about protecting gay people in the workplace, they did also rule that organizations such as the Boy Scouts, etc. could purposely exclude gay members as it went against their message. But finally, in 2015, the Supreme Court ruled that all gay marriages in all 50 states of America were legal and to be recognized. I bring all of this up just to mention how recently all of this has happened and just how long it took the U.S. to even recognize the rights of the LGBTQ plus community. Many people act as if it's been around for a long time or feels like it has, but 2015 was not that long ago. And think about how long these people fought for that right. This will play an importance when I discuss Korea's history with gay rights and just how far they have to go and what this means for the K-pop industry specifically. But for now, I want to look at something I find pretty interesting. Hollywood has always been an interesting place to me. The industry, or what I will call the Hollywood machine, is so complex with so many secrets and dark past, it would be impossible to explore it all here and now. I've always thought that old Hollywood, particularly during the 1920s to 1950s, bears a striking resemblance to modern day K-pop industries. Most actors started at a very young age, and many of them, including very famous ones such as Judy Garland, the iconic Dorothy in Wizard of Oz, were heavily mistreated and drugged as children. They were expected to maintain a certain weight, work so many hours and maintain a picture-perfect record with no scandals, and the actors were signed under different agencies or big film companies. Now, that's all very interesting for a different video, but what does any of that have to do with the LGBTQ plus community or K-pop? Well, something interesting and particularly depressing that I only recently found out during my research was that these big Hollywood movie companies were famous for marrying off actors or actresses that they thought or knew were gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Hollywood of the 1920s and 30s was a place very similar to the K-pop industry where queerness was appreciated and very popular on the stage, but off stage in the personal lives, these actors and actresses were supposed to be completely heterosexual. These marriages were arranged and functioned as a part of what History.com calls moral clauses. Moral clauses were implemented by these movie studio companies where they were allowed to stop paying their actors if they forfeit the respect of the public. This pretty much meant that actors and actresses could not step out of line because anything they did from minor criminal offenses, even down to something as simple as having a dating scandal that shocked fans enough and caused enough of a mess would lead to them effectively ending their careers. These clauses do still exist in some capacities even today. And my final thing I'd like to say about Hollywood has to do with the 2021 current Hollywood. It's been 100 years since 1920 and while acceptance in Hollywood media is 100 times more positive than it was in the past, it is still something that is either heavily exploited for over-sexualization of the queer characters or it's something that is promised as a selling point to audiences to merely seem more inclusive. There's still a serious lack of representation in Hollywood media, especially for transgendered people, non-binary, asexuals, etc., and especially lesbians who have had a hard time to not be sexualized by Hollywood. I make this point to lead us into discussing Korea's history with LGBTQ plus people and why I don't know how long it will take them to be 100% forward-thinking when it comes to queer people. Now, much like with America, I can't sit here and explain the entire history of LGBTQ plus people in relation to Korea. It's simply not possible in the amount of time that I have, but I'll explain some important parts. It should not come as a surprise that South Korea is a heavily conservative country, but it often does to many fans of K-pop or K-dramas. I can't tell you how many times I've met a new fan of these things who over-romanticize the hell out of Korea. This normally stems from a stereotype of the country and the people alongside of it being a little bit ignorant. Now, don't misunderstand understand me here and think that I'm saying that Korea or the Korean people are bad. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I don't think any country should be romanticized, not even my own country of America. And we do have a real problem here of romanticizing our own history to make us look like perfect heroes. But there are hardships in every country, and there are things that could be fixed everywhere. I think South Korea has a very beautiful culture, from the food to the art, music, scenery, and even the literature, which I've had to read a lot of for my degree. It's all very beautiful. I truly believe that the Korean Peninsula has 
one of the most interesting yet tragic histories of many countries. I highly recommend reading about Korean history, as it is very complex. The point I'm trying to make by saying that many people over-romanticize the country usually comes from younger fans, or hopefully at least, who believe that they are going to go to South Korea and it's going to be this beautiful, perfect K-drama and everyone is going to be like idol levels of pretty and everyone is going to act the way that they do in a K-drama, and that's not true at all. I mean, just think about any TV show that comes from where you live and tell me how accurately you think it betrays your actual daily life living there, because American TV shows are not realistic for life here at all, for the most part. I mean, if you go to certain parts of Korea and you're anything but a straight Korean or at least East Asian person, you're probably going to get hate crimed at least once, or at least have some racist or sexual comment made about you. And again, this isn't just Korea. It'll happen anywhere you go where you don't look or act like the normal idea of a citizen living there. My point is, South Korea is very conservative about a lot, more than you probably realize, and this shouldn't really be surprising. I mean, I'm shocked that Korea is even as progressive as it currently is. I think sometimes we forget just how little time has passed since South Korea started modernizing itself. Hell, there are probably grandparents living in Korea that remember the type of Korea you see in historical dramas, because in many places of Korea, it wasn't until after the Korean War that it was even modernized. It has happened over the span of just a few generations. I'm constantly blown away by this, and it's kind of inspiring to look at, but this can help explain the country's feelings towards LGBT issues. Many young Koreans actually seem to be more accepting and embracing of the LGBTQ lifestyle more than ever before. Much of this is probably because of the internet, but it is quite nice to see just how fast they can be at acceptance, but the older generations of Koreans are the exact opposite. Most of them are not open-minded to this idea and see it as a disgrace to the family. Many of them care more about how their family is seen from the outside than how this makes their children feel. And I speak from a perspective of coming from a family like this, with the exception of us being Korean, of course, we are not Korean. But my family is still very much like this, and the negative effects it can have on kids living in that situation are detrimental. Not to mention, in my experience, this way of thinking from an older generation is not something that can be easily changed, if even changed at all. Of course, I don't have to explain this to my LGBTQ viewers, because there are probably many of you who live in a similar situation to that. So I'll move on to talking about some laws and stances of the country of South Korea instead. South Korea has pretty much had no anti-discrimination laws when it comes to protecting LGBTQ plus people. Now, one of the worst laws that I want to talk about, some of you may have heard about. It is the Article 92-6 of the Military Penal Code. Now, I'm going to try and keep the explanation short for this in case you don't know about it, because even I didn't know about it either, but I highly recommend you look more into it because it is horrific on so many levels. All of you probably know that Korean men have to serve mandatory military service. It's a common topic in the K-pop community. During the enlistment process, men are evaluated on their physical and mental health. This is a pretty common procedure for most countries, but what makes South Korea stand out is that LGBTQ men serving in the military will be marked as having a mental handicap or personality disorder. According to the Wikipedia article of this law, they can also be institutionalized in a mental facility or be dishonorably discharged. Military personnel having reported experiencing harassment, violence, and forcible revealing of their sexual orientation and or gender identity. What's even worse is that homosexuality is criminalized, in which same sex relations, regardless of consensuality, are labeled as sexual assault slash harassment and considered punishable by a maximum of two years in prison. This doesn't need to be further explained, it's pretty straightforward, but I'll say it again for the people who didn't hear me. It's illegal, with the consequences of prison time, for two men in the military to have sex, and this includes non-penetrative sexual acts, even if both parties are consenting. Here's a recent real-life case that's been paragraphed by The Guardian, which I'll read to you now. According to an eight-page ruling seen by The Guardian in December 2020, a soldier entered another's tent over the course of two nights at a time where they were part of a group isolating due to COVID-19. By engaging in mutual oral sex, they molested one another, the ruling reads. The pair's lawyer said that the act was consensual and therefore they were innocent. The court disagreed. It interpreted that oral sex, according to the military code, bordered on rape. The defendant's conduct, it said, is considered contrary to good sexual morality and was seriously infringing on the maintenance of military discipline. So I don't really have to say much on that because I think most of you probably are just as outraged at hearing about that as I am. These are two consenting adults, and the court has the audacity to compare it to rape, which is a horrific crime and entirely different than what's happening here. The soldiers can also be charged if they're off duty, by the way, just in case someone was going to come in my comments section and try and defend this by saying, well, they shouldn't have been doing this on duty. It's not responsible. 
Well, much like American law from decades ago that we talked about a little bit earlier, the people can be tried for doing this in the privacy of their own home if they are military personnel. I mean, even President Moon Jae-in, who is a former human rights lawyer, I might add, said that before he became president, he was against homosexuality and did not like it, and to my understanding, has that stance still today. So now that we understand just a little bit about South Korea's stance on LGBTQ plus people, let's finally get into what you've all come here for, how this pertains to K-pop. I think the best way to start this is to mention the very noticeable fact that the K-pop community is heavily made up of people who are LGBTQ+. Like, go to any K-pop stan's Twitter bio and like 7 out of 10 times, they will be LGBTQ+. And I personally love that. While the K-pop industry may not always be the most accepting, which we'll get into, I find that many fans are. I would go so far as to say that the K-pop community is probably one of the most accepting communities of other fans who are LGBTQ. It's always very heartwarming to see. I mean, I know for a fact many of you guys are LGBTQ+, because you've told me, either through comments or DMs. So because there is a large part of the fan base that this directly affects, we will be talking about how harmful some of these actions of the industry can be and why it's wrong. I mean, it's pretty much the same principle that we discussed in our cultural appropriation video, which is that the industry seeks to profit off of this market while actively hate criming those same people. So let's start an in-depth look at what and how exactly the industry does this. I think a good place to start when discussing marketing tactics is skinship and fan service. Now, it's no secret that skinship is more acceptable in Korea than it is in Western countries. Like, I don't know about where y'all live, but where I live, it's almost impossible to find two guys who are comfortable enough with their sexuality that they'll hold hands or even hug their other guy friends. And if they do, they have to make some big deal about like slapping them on the back after or fist bumping them to send the message of like, hey. I'm not gay though, as if being gay is some kind of insult. Firstly, let me give a rough definition of skinship, although most of you probably know about it. It's the name for when idols are overly touchy with each other, like holding hands, hugging, cuddling, pretty much any form of physical contact that expresses a fondness or caring for another person. Now, I'm not here to convince you that all skinship is fake and part of some marketing tactic, because I don't even believe that myself. I think skinship can be overplayed at times for the cameras, but I genuinely believe a lot of the times it can be genuine. I think most of the time these idols probably are just that close with each other and enjoy each other's company and seek some comfort from each other. But like I mentioned before, I also do think that there are times where companies or managers will tell two members to kind of lay it on a bit thicker for fan service for the fans. Now, what is fan service? Fan service is something expressly added or done for the enjoyment of the fans. It's known that by doing this thing, it will please a large part of the audience. So they do that, which is fan service. In many forms of media, it's usually more sexual in nature, but in K-pop, a lot of the times it's really not that sexual. In K-pop it's more things like skinship or singing a specific jokey type of song or wearing cute versions of stage outfits, etc. Now, I don't even think that fan service is entirely bad in of itself. It's a fun way to give back to the fans, but I do think it can carry major problems with it, such as some fans really buying into that fan service so hard that they don't even realize that it is fan service. These things are done as a business model by companies, and I'm not saying idols don't enjoy doing these things or do them just for money because even I don't believe that, but I do think that the company takes these things into account when it comes to the success and business of the group. It's a way to keep fans engaged with a group so they'll continue standing the group and spending money on albums, light sticks, and concerts. And it's pretty much foolproof. I mean, all of us fall victim to this constantly. And like I said before, I don't think it's always bad. Most of the time, I can appreciate it for what it is, but it gets dangerous when it starts to border on queer baiting. Now, what is queer baiting? Well, queer baiting is a marketing technique for fiction and entertainment in which creators hint at, but then do not actually depict same-sex romance or other LGBTQ plus representation. Now, some good examples of this would be Gaston's friends in the live-action Beauty and the Beast movie from a few years back. I remember Disney practically marketing that this man was going to be like one of the first on-screen gay Disney characters ever, and then he just wasn't. I mean, he was seen in a shot dancing with a man for like 0.2 seconds at the very end of the movie, in the hopes that all the overly conservative parents didn't catch it, but still just enough so that Disney could cash in on the LGBT market. Queer baiting by definition is typically reserved for fiction or entertainment, so many people will tell you that idols can't queer bait off screen, but I would argue differently. Of course idols can queer bait on screen. We see it all the time in music videos. I mean, when you see two members practically kissing or hugging with their shirts off, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, that's a very clear queer baiting, and most people wouldn't argue otherwise. But I think K-pop 
is unique because a lot of what is presented to the audience in vlogs or variety shows is also a part of that fictional storyline or overly censored. So I would argue that K-pop is in of itself so fictional in so many ways that they can queer bait in a marketing way. Because let's compare the situations. Disney promised viewers a gay character by constantly teasing it and then they didn't deliver on that promise. In K-pop companies, they will constantly have idols be overly touchy with each other in music videos, at concerts, or variety shows. You guys know those games that they have idols do where they pass a piece of paper from mouth to mouth, or the Pepero game where two idols chew that damn stick until they almost kiss. To me, that comes across as selling the idea of these two idols being in or the potential to be in a gay relationship. They monetize the hell out of that kind of content, but none of those idols are ever openly queer, so it is, in a way, queer baiting to me. The idea of these two being gay is presented to the audience, and the audience likes that a lot, but it's never actually followed through with. They merely act gay to profit off of people, and it works more than we realize. Now, I have to be careful what I say here because I know that shipping is very popular, it's a very popular thing, and there's probably a few of you who do this as well. I don't want to accidentally hurt any of your guys' feelings or seem like I'm attacking you because that's not my intention at all, but this is something that we have to talk about due to this topic. So if you think you're going to be sensitive to this topic, maybe just skip ahead a bit, although I will say that I do think this is pretty important. Now, I think if you ship members in a friendship way, then it's fine. Like, maybe there's a particular friendship you like in the group and you like their dynamic, so you watch or make videos of their jokes and conversations, then that's fine. I have plenty of K-pop friendships that I think are really fun to watch, but it's when shipping turns romantic that I see a problem in it. This phenomenon of fans making proof videos that these two idols are actually dating and that they will defend that to the death is honestly just creepy to me. And for the record, I don't think the people who do this realize that what they're doing is weird, wrong, and damaging to others, but it is. And I'm here to explain why. Because many of you might just be saying, oh, it's just a simple ship. What's the harm in it? Well, do I have news for you? There are two topics I want to focus on when addressing why this is weird and wrong to do, and I hope maybe at least one person will see what I mean by this. Number one, we'll be talking about this more in detail at a later point in the video, so don't worry, I'll cover it a little bit more then, but let's be honest. There's a weird thing going on that isn't talked about a lot, and this doesn't just happen in K-pop, I see it literally everywhere in so many different fandoms. There's this thing where girls, typically young girls, but they can in theory be any age, who sexualize the hell out of gay men and gay male relationships, now, don't worry, because later we will also discuss how lesbian or women love women relationships are equally sexualized by men, but for shipping purposes, it's not always, but largely, this collection of young girls who fetishize gay men, and it's creepy, guys. Y'all have got to stop that behavior. Like I said, we'll cover that more a little bit later, so let's move on to the second reason why romantic shipping is a bad thing. Number two, it is in a way assuming or projecting someone's sexuality. Like, for starters, what if one of the members that you're shipping is actually gay? It's bordering on the edge of of outing them without actually outing them. And as we've established, being LGBTQ plus in Korea is maybe not the safest thing. These videos or fan fictions may indirectly make the idol feel uncomfortable because in Korea, they more than likely can't be open about their sexuality. So this thing could worry or stress them out. I have many friends in the LGBTQ plus community and I've said before that where I live in America is not the most accepting place, especially of LGBTQ plus people. Many of my friends before they came out lived with very conservative or very overly religious families and something that made them very scared was that someone was going to accidentally out them and have them kicked out of their house in response to that. Oftentimes, even jokes about them being in relationship with other members of the same gender made them very uncomfortable and filled with anxiety, especially if these jokes were made in front of their family members. So it's a similar thing here, but on a much larger scale. It's not just a family that an idol would have to worry about, but their entire country. And while they would receive massive amounts of support from many fans, the people closest to them might not feel that way. And that's heartbreaking. Or what if the members being shipped aren't gay, and it makes them uncomfortable to show affection with their other members anymore? Now, like I said, I want to make a clear distinction here and say that liking a certain duo as a cute friendship, or liking their dynamic, or even fan art as long as it's not overly sexual or romantic, is fine in my opinion. You are simply appreciating a friendship, and that's cool. But overly obsessively believing that two people are dating or having sex is fucking weird. Even if it's true, which it could be, but it's none of our business. If I was 
famous and I was making a video with my friend, no matter their gender, and people were making theories that we were having sex, it would make me not want to hang out with that person anymore. And this doesn't just go for same genders, but for the opposite ones as well. If I was an idol, I wouldn't even want to look at the stage at award shows because someone might think we're dating, or I wouldn't even congratulate someone on winning something out of fear that brief eye contact is enough to get dispatch in my area. Now, I would also like to say that there are some ships where the idols have said that they are fine with it. For example, one of the most popular ships in K-pop is Wusan, which is a ship between Wu Young and San of ATs. Now, they might have retracted this statement and I just haven't heard about it, but I remember seeing them getting really excited and saying how cute it was that fans had put their names together into Wusan. I think when idols are more accepting, then making jokes or something is a bit more acceptable, but I still wouldn't ever make it sexual because again, that just feels invasive to me, but what do I know? Now let's talk about something important before delving more into this topic of fetishization. What is the male gaze? Well, theconversation.com defines it as this. The male gaze invokes the sexual politics of the gaze and suggests a sexualized way of looking that empowers men and objectifies women. In the male gaze, women are visually positioned as an object of heterosexual male desire. Her feelings, thoughts, and her own sexual drives are less important than her being framed by male desire. We see examples of this everywhere in modern media where women are sexualized to hell and back. And it's something important to look at in reference to how K-pop groups are marketed. Now, I do apologize that most of this conversation has been focused focused on the binary and hasn't mentioned the non-binary a lot. Well, simply put, it's hard to talk about non-binary when it comes to K-pop because the idol groups are based on a binary system. Boy groups and girl groups with a handful of co-ed groups rarely tossed in. So I do apologize to all my non-binary pals. I see y'all and I love you very much. Don't think that I ignored you for this conversation, please. But the K-pop market is mainly focused on boy groups and girl groups, and these two are marketed in very different ways. Girl groups having a much larger fan base of males than one might originally think. And you can see this is how some of the groups are marketed. Now, you might say that these are just stylistic choices and stop looking so much into it, but that's just it. These are choices, and no choice, especially in the music industry, is made without thinking about its implications. We're going to talk about the difference in how boy groups and girl groups are marketed right after we define the female gaze, because this is all actually important when understanding the fetishization of LGBTQ plus people. Well, what is the female gaze? It is, simply put, the ways in which women and girls look at other females, at males, and at things in the world. This concerns the kinds of looking involved and how these may be related to identification, objectification, subjectivity and the performance and construction of gender. It is less sexual in nature and focuses more on the emotional side of the character or person presented. So how does this affect K-pop and more so, how does it affect LGBTQ plus people? Well, it's a long and complex topic that could, in theory, have its own separate video. But simply put, girl groups are often more pressured to look a certain way, get a certain surgery, or lose excessive amounts of weight to fit the male standard of beauty. Now, male idols go through this too, 100%, don't get me wrong, but it happens a lot more to females in and outside of Korea. You'll also hear men be more comfortable talking about their struggles with it. Now, it takes a lot of courage for these men to come forward with this information, but it just seems to be more out in the open for men because they have a much larger more empathetic female fan base. Like, for example, I personally see more men discussing their diets or workouts that they had for a specific comeback because men are equally pressured by the male gaze as well to be muscular or well-built, but I rarely see women so open with it. Women's weight loss is supposed to be hidden behind a curtain. Their insecurities shouldn't be focused on because it defies the male gaze. The male gaze, in theory, strips the woman of everything that makes her her. She's a vessel to look at and hardly nothing more. She shouldn't complain, shouldn't have loud opinions, and should just sit there in a short skirt and a crop top and shut up. I even read this article where this new group of men in Korea have these high standards of their girlfriends to look like female idols, even going so far as to starve them or make them get plastic surgery. Now, like I said, men are equally sexualized by fans, a lot as well, and I mean a lot. So let's talk about that and specifically what it means for LGBT men. As we've already discussed, both men and women are sexualized. My non-binary friends can be as well, by the way, but what's the difference between the sexualization of gay, bi, male love male men versus lesbian, bi, or women love women women? Well, the Lamron puts it well and says this. The primary culprit of this over-sexualization of gay male relationships is often the straight cis female. It isn't hard to guess the cause of this toxic attachment style either. Men are inherently threatening. They often have physical and social power over women. Women are therefore attracted to 
less threatening men or men whom they feel have less power over them. The gay man poses less of a threat to women and therefore suits the female gaze. He's not intimidating or a figure to be nervous around. Thus, fan bases are constructed by individuals who don't feel threatened by these gay men. The sexualization of man loves man relationships stems from the presupposition that gay men are not a threat to straight cis women and therefore can be used as a lens through which cis straight women may explore their own sexual desires without the threat of a straight man or vulnerable woman in the fantasy. So, to make it clear, the sexualization of gay men is still sexual. There's often this misconception that BL dramas or fan fictions are more focused on the emotional side, so they aren't as damaging as women love women fiction when fetishized, but that's simply not true. While it is true that gay fiction between two men written by women can, on average, be more focused on the emotional aspects of the relationship than its female counterpart, it is still sexual as hell. It's the perfect definition of female versus male gaze. The female fan fiction writers and overly sexual shippers are still focused on the sexual aspect of it, they just put a more emotional connection in it, and they do this so they don't have to fear writing a toxic male character who treats a woman badly or writing a female character who is utterly dependent on the male. Gay men are real people who have regular relationships. Not every gay relationship is going to have the stereotypical feminine male and masculine male that's imposing gender norms on something that shouldn't have them. It's something that is taken and fetishized by an uninvolved party and it's gross. Now, there's this misconception that women love women relationships are more accepted by society than male love male relationships, and that's simply not true. If anything, it might be closer to the opposite, although neither is truly accepted in the areas we are discussing. Feminine lesbian relationships are more accepted by men because of one, sexual fantasies, and two, this idea that, oh, it's just a phase for her, or she's never had a good enough man in bed, which, honest to god, makes me want to vomit. I don't think I have to spend very long on this section because most of you probably understand this as a large percentage of my audience are female themselves. The sexualization of women love women is so blatantly obvious in film, television, and other forms of media, and it stems from this idea that women are helpless creatures who can't decide for themselves so they must be led down the path of straightness. Or the idea that women are only with each other for men's pleasure. That is the inherent privilege that men have. Bringing it back to K-pop, we can see this from time to time in music videos where women are cuddled up with each other, hugging in a more romantic manner, or just straight up almost kissing or actually kissing. There's not as much of a big fuss made about two women being close because it buys into the male gaze and the male fantasy. Let me make this final thing clear for everyone. Women are not with other women to garner male attention. Women are not with women because they have yet to have a good D. Women are with women because they like women. It's as simple as that. And a lesbian couple shouldn't have to fear walking down the street holding hands because they might get catcalled or run up on. Now, we've discussed a lot about LGBTQ plus community, but we have yet to hit the T in that acronym. So, let's discuss that. Now, this section is probably going to be a little bit shorter because there's not a lot of representation for transgender people in the K-pop community. There are three specific instances of either a trans idol or a group that I'll be talking about, but there could be more, less known ones that I'm unfamiliar with. Either way, this issue deserves to be talked about more. The first person we'll be talking about is Harasu, whose name I probably just butchered, so I'm sorry about that. Her Wikipedia page states that Harasu is a Korean pop singer, model, and actress. Assigned male at birth, Harasu identified as female from early childhood and underwent sex reassignment surgery in the 1990s. She is the Republic of Korea's first transgender entertainer and in 2002 became the second person in Korea to legally change their gender. As the Republic of Korea's first transgender entertainer, there was a great deal of media interest in Harasu, and she was routinely described as being more beautiful than a woman. As of 2008, Harasu believed that she still faced discrimination within the entertainment industry, saying on television, many people pretend to smile and welcome me, but after the filming, they'd scold me behind my back. Her father in particular had great difficulty accepting his child as a daughter, but her family have since accepted this and show great pride in her career. Harasu has been given credit for raising social awareness of transgender people in the Republic of Korea and has said in interviews that she hopes to become a role model for other trans people. Another instance of trans Trans representation in K-pop is the all-trans group called Lady. As stated by otakukart.com, the K-pop group was inspired by Harasu, South Korea's transgender singer, although the group received hate since sex reassignment surgery was illegal in 2005. Moreover, people looked down on them, which quickly turned into a controversy. As the group came out in 2005, the people of Korea were still adapting to Western culture, hence welcoming an all-transgender K-pop group was too much for them. However, after that, another controversy broke. The group started getting bad publicity and they became more 
more visible in the eyes of the media and the public. A photo book called Women Reflect was released to bring the group more attention. The book contained nude pictures of all the members, which outraged the public more. This was super controversial in the nation 15 years ago, and they did sadly disband after two years. And our last instance of representation is the girl group Mercury, who had one trans member, Hanbit. There isn't much about them, sadly. They debuted in 2016, and while no disbandment has been confirmed, it's believed that they disbanded that same year. The only thing I can really give you from this is a quote from Hanbit herself, where she says, quote, living with the female body itself brought me the greatest feeling of euphoria, but also that she has a fond memory of living the past before the operation. These are the three most famous instances of trans idols in K-pop, so it is definitely a topic that deserves to be looked at into separately and on its own time. There's a serious lack of representation for young trans Korean kids, and most of these ladies I mentioned have seemingly fallen off the map from mainstream media, but I hope they're all doing well wherever they are now. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not here to stir up drama. If these idols apologize for these actions, then fine. But some of the things I'll be discussing are honestly disgusting. I'm not here with an opinion because I barely even know these idols. And I also don't claim that these are all the homophobic idols in the industry. These are just a couple. And I'm only here to state the facts that were presented to me. Number one, Zyko. He was a member of the boy group Block B, and in his song Tough Cookie, he used the F slur multiple times. I'm not going to say it. I assume most of you know what it is. Now, I'm not crazy familiar with Zyko nor even Block B that much, so I am completely unbiased here. I literally don't claim to know anything about this man, and I am sure there are more educated, older K-pop fans who are and can help you. Zyko did issue an apology for this through his company, stating something like this. We were not looking down on homosexuals, a representative of the agency said. This song was used in a musical sense. If we had known exactly that the word has the meaning of looking down on homosexuals, we would not have used it. Zyko does not have any bias or negative feelings towards homosexuals, and holds respect for them. We would like to apologize to anyone who felt uncomfortable. However, netizens also noticed a confederate flag on the sleeve of his jacket in that music video. The flag of the slave states during the American Civil War is a symbol of racism and often used by the KKK, so I don't know if he just really fucked up that day or what was happening there. Like, you woke up and decided I'm not gonna commit one but two hate crimes? That's tough, buddy. As I said before, I'm sure there are people much more educated on this man than me, or feel free to research this yourself as well. I have no idea what this man is up to right now, and I am fine continuing to do that. C1. He is a member of Super Junior and is a devout Christian. Now, I mention this since religion seems to play a large part in his opinion. In an interview, he had stated the following, I will respectfully refuse any such offers. While I respect all genders, I do not wish to acknowledge homosexuals, as I've been taught that God created man and woman with specific characteristics and duties. I realize that with globalization, there are many entertainers who do not share my views. There are those who are value-oriented, and there are those who are successful oriented. However, shouldn't an actor deliver on his image to his audience through roles he chooses to portray based on his beliefs in life? One comment from a netizen regarding the situation was, he's quite playful with his members' skinship, but for some reason can't handle a homosexual character. He then proceeded to retweet some particularly homophobic tweets by a politician against gay marriage. Siwon later issued an apology. In this statement, he said, I retweeted a source that has another opinion about legalizing gay marriage. However, I belatedly realized that this was not just a matter of poor posting a source's opinion after reading many tweets sent to me. My thoughtless tweets hurt a lot of people, and I'm humbled by the fact that I gave pain to a lot of fans, staff, and everyone else. I would like to communicate and learn more in the future. Again, I apologize to everyone I hurt with my retweets, but I think from what I've seen, most people don't give a shit. People were quick to call out the hypocrisy of Siwon being willing to do some of the most sexual skinship with his members that I have ever seen to make money off of gay people, but then turn around and not want them to have basic human rights. Again, I don't keep up with this man enough to know if he's changed at all, so take everything I say with that in mind. He may be a great person now, I don't know him very well. Now, there are probably more idols that I could cover here, but we've been talking about depression stuff for a while, so I want to talk about some positives. Disclaimer, this is by no means all the idols in the industry who are supportive, so feel free to leave more in the comments below. BTS Yoongi. Now, I'm pretty sure all of BTS seem to support LGBTQ plus people, but Yoongi seems particularly out there with his support, stating, quote, there's nothing wrong with being LGBTQ plus, everyone is equal. And pretty much all ARMY, know that this man collects lesbians like their keychains. That's a joke, by the way. It's a joke in the community that a lot of Yoongi biases are lesbian. Don't take that too seriously. Sunmi. 
Sunmi proudly spoke about identity. While some people thought Sunmi was coming out as part of the LGBT community, Sunmi took to Twitter to explain that, that she supports LGBT but was not part of the community. She was just an ally. And I personally remember in some interview about her recent comeback that she said she was open to feelings or something with a woman, but again, I think that's just from an ally standpoint. As she stated herself, she's just a big supporter of LGBTQ plus people, and we don't want to assume sexuality here. That's a big no-no. Shiny Jonghyun. As stated by K-pop stars, Jonghyun previously changed his profile picture on his Twitter account to a handwritten letter of a transgender student from Sung Kong Hae University. Sorry for butchering that. At the time, there was an Anyang protest, sorry for butchering that, which highlights the discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community in South Korea. It was later revealed by the student Kang Yoon Ha that Jonghyun had reached out to her to inform her that he would be using the letter as his profile picture and asked if it was alright because he did not want to put unwanted attention onto her. He then went on to say, I support you. As a celebrity, as a minority of a different type in front of the public, I also feel disappointment towards the world that does not accept our differences. Of course, I can't compare that to what you feel. Mamamoo. According to the same website, Mamamoo is a group that has openly supported the LGBTQ plus movement, saying that they love and care for people from every race, sexuality, religion, and gender. The group was all seen wearing rainbow mo pins, which come from the first ever queer K fandom community. Proceeds from the pins go to queer projects every year. The group was also pictured with Harasu, the transgender singer that we talked about recently, and the second person in South Korea to legally change their sex. Now, there are many other groups and idols who seem to be supportive, such as, but not limited to, Stray Kids, ATs, Blackpink's Rosé, Twice. TXT is commonly joked about by the LGBTQ plus community for being the group for the gays, so do with that what you will, and many other idols or groups that I'm sure people will list in the comments. Now, an idol who I didn't even know about until this video is Holland, and let me just say, I listened to his song Neverland and it was added to my playlist. It's just a nice vibe, and I highly recommend people to go support this icon for being himself in the industry. According to CNN.com, this is a bit about him and his story. For context, Holland wanted to debut as himself, as a gay idol. Quote, they said it would be bad for my image, Holland told CNN. To Holland, that was a deal breaker. He had been badly bullied in middle school and it was important to him to be open about his sexuality, so he quit the label and debuted as an independent artist. I wanted to prove that I am worthy of love and that I'm worthy of achieving and being accomplished, he said. I felt that this was the only way I could love myself. When he debuted in 2018, he attracted a lot of positive attention overseas, but back home in South Korea, the reaction was muted or even negative. Nevertheless, Holland remained determined to make a statement. While filming the music video for his first single, Neverland, the director told him that there would be a 19 plus rating in South Korea if the clip showed any same-sex affection. So Holland decided to include a scene where he kisses a man to prompt audiences to consider why a same-sex kiss deserved an explicit rating when a kiss between a man and a woman wouldn't. He finds it sad when shows make stars kiss each other. Quote, they make it into funny content to embarrass them, Holland said. It's a shame that's the limit they can go to when it comes to showing homosexual interaction. It can only be portrayed as funny. All I gotta say is, send your love and support his way because he seems like a super genuine and nice person from the small bit that I've learned about him over the course of the past few days. Now, there may be a few other LGBTQ plus idols who are open, and I'm sure, once again, that subscribers will leave them in the comments because I'd love to support them, but Holland is the most well-known one, so he is who I covered. Now, this video is getting pretty long, so I'm going to start wrapping up my statements here. Now, we've covered a lot of information, but there's also a lot that we haven't even scratched the surface of. But again, I only have so much time here as I don't think you guys want a feature-length film. Homophobia is prevalent in Korea and the K-pop industry, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. It's an issue often ignored by the mainstream, but I don't want to do that. It's something that deserves its attention because it hurts real people. These companies present the message of, well, we need you to act gay for profit, but don't actually be gay or we'll most likely fire you. It's a hypocritical and disgusting standpoint, but it's not one that seems like it's changing. I don't think that this will change until the actual country of South Korea does. And as I said at the beginning of the video, it's starting to bit by bit, but not nearly fast enough. You can't expect people to sit around and wait to be given permission to love who they want to love or be the gender that they are. When you tell people to wait until the country changes a bit more, you're part of the problem. LGBTQ plus people can't, won't, and shouldn't have to wait for basic human rights. Why does it matter who they love in their private lives? Why is it anyone's business but their own? Why does the government feel like they have the right to control that part of people? It's simple. 
In the K-pop industry, gay people are seen as either a product to sell or a person to be marketed towards, much like black people when speaking of cultural appropriation. They know that LGBTQ plus people make a large percentage of the fan base, so they cater to it by profiting off of it, all while shaming it or putting it down. There are real fans of the industry and real people living in South Korea who are LGBTQ+, and they deserve to have the idols who they can look up to because, let's be real, there are definitely gay idols. You're an idiot if you think otherwise. It's just basic math. Taking into account how many idols there are, probability-wise, at least one of them has to be gay. And that's something homophobic stands are gonna have to suck up because it's not their decision and it's not their life to control. There are many groups or idols who seem to support gay rights, but they unfortunately live in a place where they can't be too loud about it or they'll be ridiculed or fired themselves and that fucking sucks. And finally, a word to my LGBTQ plus viewers. I can't express to you how sorry I am to you all that this is the shit that as a fan of the industry you have to deal with. I don't know your personal situations, but know that my channel is always a safe place for you. I hope you are safe and happy and surrounded by people who support you and if no one in your life knows about you then i'll support you it can be a lot easier to talk to or be open with a stranger on the internet so know that i and many others are in your corner if you ever need to talk to someone please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of my other subscribers who are supportive i love all of you very much and i am so unbelievably proud of the courage you have to be yourself even if you aren't out yet you are still an incredibly courageous person i hope the best for all of you and i hope that one day people can get their heads out of other people's business long enough to support you much love to you all i hope every viewer enjoyed this video and i'll see you guys next time bye